Hello, the Indiana Arborist Association 2021 Virtual Conference. This is Scott Baker coming to you from Seattle, Washington. I'm going to give you a short talk today entitled Tree Biomechanics and Tree Supported Structures. Only have 30 minutes, so it's a bit of a teaser, and I hope you'll see the handout for some additional information and perhaps get to hear more about this interesting subject in the future. So here's a picture to get you going. I'll tell you a little bit about my involvement in this world. It really began with treehouse people. I call them treehousers. And for the last 25 years, I've been giving talks at the World Treehouse Conference. The reason I got there was one of the most famous treehouse builders in the U.S., a guy named Michael Garnier, sought me out uh, because he learned that I had some knowledge that he needed. So this picture here is kind of gets you going. This treehouse here uh, very, very expensive, probably over a million dollars invested in this structure. And in this picture, a team of treehousers are setting a new foundation, as they call it. They're reattaching this treehouse to the tree with an engineered uh, uh, system of attachments. So the reason for doing this was that the original treehouse was not built using an engineer, and it was not safe. Interestingly, these are redwoods in California. And these are all stump sprouts. These are sprouts that have grown back from redwoods that have been logged. So the treehousers roped me in, and then you know, a little while after that, they turned me on to a group called the Association for Challenge Course Technology. And they insisted that I had to go to this group's conference, which I did. So for about 12 years now, either myself or one of my colleagues from Tree Solutions has been going to the ACCT conference and helping people building in trees learn more about what they're doing. So there's some professional groups that represent this industry. I just mentioned ACCT. They have their own ANSI standard. They also have an ASTM standard. That's the uh, American Society for Testing and Materials. Those are the metal bits and pieces, the engineering of cableways, etc. And like us, they decided to self-regulate. We also have a European equivalent of ACCT, the European Ropes Course Association. They have a professional standard for mobile and stationary ropes courses. And then another standard that I'm aware of is from Australia, the Australian standard for artificial climbing structures and challenge courses, both fixed and mobile. It's really interesting to know these are out there. You get involved with helping these people out. They are following these, hopefully, and you should. So these standards from ACCT cover installation and equipment, inspection, operations. They have a certification for practitioners. They have a qualified challenge course professional credential that you can earn. And these are the people that end up inspecting these courses on a regular basis. They are not arborists, and there's very little regarding trees in most of the standards at, the current, at this current time. So design performance and inspection standards are included in there. There are standards for operations. There are standards for training. And then there's certification standards that they've come up with over the years. So you, if you're finding yourself uh, being approached to work on these courses, it's very useful to know and find out whether the course is being inspected by a uh, certified practitioner. This has become a big business. They go through a ton of gear, okay, because of safety concerns and because just a lot of wear and tear when you have dozens and dozens of people uh, wearing harnesses and helmets every day, day in, day out. So I happen to know that this has become one of Petzl's largest markets. And there's innovation occurring all the time. And many manufacturers have jumped on the bandwagon here. So there's a lot going on out here in this world. So knowledge of trees really is important. For instance, how will the installation change the existing dynamic system in a single tree or in the forest? How much is too much if you attach 20 different things to a tree, are you going to overwhelm it? It's important to keep in mind that the bolts or tree attachment bolts, tabs in a tree, are basically holes in the tree's vascular system. It's also useful to think about the loading that occurs. When a static load is added to a tree's trunk, what response can be expected? Well, you arborists should know that we may see additional growth in that area in response to the load that the attached structure has put on. So these attachments have really been changing with the advent, uh, advent of commercially built and engineered treehouses. When treehouses need to meet building codes and building codes for commercial occupancy, 
Well, then engineers get involved and building code officials, and they have to go forward. Every year at the World Treehouse Conference, we see a new innovation or more. So just to teach you a little bit about this, there are several basic methods that are used to attach to a tree. And this is from the treehousers uh, world. Uh, the perch method, where the structural member is perched on a tree attachment bolt, a tab, or it can be put on part of the tree, such as resting on a limb or on a crotch in the tree. You see quite a bit of this. Hang or suspend, where the structural member is suspended using steel cable attached to the tree. Pin. When we pin to the tree, this means we're attaching the structural member so that it cannot move to the tree. So pin to the tree with a tab, a bolt, or even a large nail in some cases. Wrapping. In the zip line industry and in challenge adventure courses, it's still common to see a cable wrapped around a tree, often using box to hold the cable off the tree part. Uh, but this is kind of a sketchy uh, way to go about things, as we know, but the tree house people don't know. And really, there's a lot of information that we don't have about the species specificity, how different species react. Here's some pictures of some of the early tree attachment bolts. This is a Garnier heavy limb up there on the left. And the picture behind the steel bolt there is a, uh, uh, a drawing from the engineer. It's a representation of a finite element analysis. It's a very sophisticated analysis of uh, a treehouse engineering project accounting for the dynamic movement in the tree. I remember showing this picture to some of my German science pals years and years ago, and they were stunned to know that somebody was using this kind of sophisticated analysis to build tree houses. And you can see on the right some of the fittings that are attached to the tabs to hold lumber and other uh, things that they want to attach. So let's remember, arborists, that those tree house attachment bolts, originally called the Garnier limb, do not function like a tree branch. When that pin is in the tree, there is no expansion of the pin every year to allow it to bond with the tree. So in this famous diagram here from Alex Shigo, you can see what really happens with tree branches and why they are so strongly attached to trees. They are essentially welded into the tree. So interestingly, when you put a tree attachment bolt into a tree, you're really making a hole that's more, more similar to a flush cut than it would be to a branch. And you can see in the cutaway there on, on the uh, right-hand uh, picture, it also from Shigo, a flush cut and the resulting decay columns that are occurring. And a proper branch cut where any decay that is occurring is trapped in the wood of the branch. So the difficulty with the tree pins is as the tree grows, it's going to continue to envelop that pin. There's some very interesting things that can occur as this occurs as this happens. Now here's Michael Garnier himself, a little bit blurry, but uh, the picture of the tree attachment bolts, those are cadmium plated bolts there to cut down on corrosion. And also the very slippery coating makes those easier to put into the tree. It takes a great deal of force to put these bolts into a tree. Here's some um, more examples of tree attachment bolts with uh, this one designed to be extendable. So as the tree grows, the hope is that they'll be able to move things out. And you can see one of the early uh, lighter weight pins down there in the bottom that's been bent. And that probably was done at the World Treehouse Conference where we've been doing destructive testing uh, in fairly uh, you know, backyard conditions, but with load cells and trying to understand more about how much weight these various pins would hold. So when you put these things in, there's a lot to think about, and you just never know what you're going to find. So as you can see here, two examples, one, a knee brace, where pretty quickly here, the tree trunk is going to be starting to contact the wooden structural member and envelop it. And there doesn't appear to be any method for moving that away from the tree there. On the right, you see a tree attachment bolt with a more modern engineered approach using a second bolt and a cable to pick up the cantilever load and allow the big beam there that you see to be pushed way out on the pin further from the tree to allow room for growth. 
So they're innovative and they're trying. Here is an example of a perch uh, connection. And this is used when you have multiple trees in a treehouse and you may be attaching firmly, pinning to one tree. But in order to allow movement, the uh, other end of the beam is perched and it's allowed to slide. And that's a, a very slick piece of plastic in there that allows this to occur with no noise. Treehouses can be very noisy. Here's an example from the World Treehouse Conference of a bolt that we pulled to failure. And then I dissected the tree so we could see what was happening. And the biomechanical transmission of force or the transmission of force from the treehouse load to the biomechanics of the tree is occurring right on the bus there. The bus is the thicker area of the pin, which allows more surface area for the load to be distributed over. So in this case, we pulled on the pin and force was directed down and up. And eventually we had the wood fiber crushed and the pin essentially failed. It didn't bend, but the tree failed. So in this case, you know, this was a small pin this is many years ago, but still we're talking thousands of pounds of force required to cause failure. So again, a lot of questions from the tree houses about how to put these in with the least amount of interruption of the tree. And as I always point out to them, a hole in the tree like this is a hole in the vascular system of the tree. You must limit these as much as possible. What you see here is a shot taken from a treehouse TV site. Actually, it's Tim Kovar's site in Oregon City. Tim is Tree Climbing Planet. You ought to look him up. And the special bit that they use to put that hole in the tree. And the, these are very educated guys putting this in. They've heard me talk a lot and they pay close attention. And they're wondering what the effect is here. What should they do? They're into the wood of the tree where they need the pin to rest, but the tree isn't round. So they were concerned about the fact that this hole is uneven on both sides. So answering questions like these, which have to do with tree physiology and also with attempting to, well, you know, to uh, match the mechanical advantage of the pin with the biomechanics of the tree. That's the kind of things that I help with. Here's a very modern pin from Charlie Greenwood, the XL. These pins are designed to be extended over time. In the lower picture there, you can see in the orange helmet standing, Charlie Greenwood himself. And then another orange helmet is Chris Madison. We were doing some testing on the site on the day they were doing this. And what he's doing there with the micrometer that you can see is he's loading the uh, pin to the design load looking for movement. And with this design, he can then tighten the pin if a little bit of movement has occurred and uh, hoping that then the design load will not cause any wiggling of that pin. And you can also see the very sophisticated drill bit actually designed and created by uh, Charlie uh, Greenwood himself. Here are some of the tools that are used, uh, commonly used. Um, and some of those big heavy limbs that you saw on the tree, the giant uh, driver drill and the uh, heavy drill being used very precisely to put the pilot hole in the tree. You have to be really precise with these or you get into trouble. I put this slide in. I thought you all find it quite interesting. Those two pins that you saw in the tree with Charlie Greenwood standing there. This is several years later, and uh, this treehouse is just being completed. It's a handicap access treehouse at Treehouse Point. That's Pete Nelson's uh, facility out, out near me in Seattle. Uh, the wooden uh, structure that you see there is scaffolding that they've built to keep off the ground while they build the treehouse. And this is something I've, uh, you know, spoken to tree houses and zip line builders out for many years because I noticed that they just trash the root zone of the trees uh, when they build unless they're aware that that's a problem. As long as they're aware, they're very good at figuring out ways to stay off the ground. This tree house, as you can see, is held up by a massive engineered steel truss. It's quite remarkable. So testing. We've begun to do more and more testing. This picture is from Pete Nelson's crew, Scott Atkins and uh, the other builders that work with Pete. And then some of the projects they're doing, they've realized that they need more information. So they've worked with engineers and a testing lab. 
to do testing to failure of uh, different pins in different types of wood. So here you see a test being done in Douglas fir. And here's one in Western red cedar, a much, much, much less uh, strong wood. And this pin has been pulled to failure. And you can see that basically what happened here is the pin didn't bend or break, but the wood fiber was crushed by the load. So with this data that we can go to engineers and have a pretty good idea what kind of loads we'll be able to handle with the hardware that's being proposed. And that allows you to go forward and actually get. This is the original commercial occupancy treehouse in the U.S. with a building permit. Now, this is in 1980, and Michael had been fighting for about five years until he get to, to get this permit. Um, it's a very long story, you know, a lot of laughs in there, a lot of fun stuff, but um, it's possible. And more recently, uh, my group, Tree Solutions, has worked with treehouse builders in many different states to get commercial occupancy or just a regular building permit for a tree house that's going to be occupied. So you find a wide variety of ability to understand trees within this group. It has gotten much, much better since I first started showing up at the ACCT conference. We now have members there that are certified arborists. I've uh, uh, referred work to many of other of my consultant friends and kind of spread the word. But, you know, when I got involved and still we find people doing this who don't know that much about trees. So here this picture up in the boreal forest in Alaska. And well, hello, did they see that crack in the tree when they put the zipline guy cable on the tree? Or did that crack occur as a result of? Now, these are the kind of questions you're gonna get asked, but nobody had noticed this until I got there. And then frankly, it, it uh, got my attention. There's another innovation. This is a uh, Ken Huck innovation. It's a ring, compression ring, they call them. There, there are no holes drilled in the tree for this. Those pins are just pressing really, really hard on the uh, trunk of the tree. Now, you all will probably realize that after a few years, there will essentially be a hole in the tree. Those pins are crushing the cambium. There'll be no ability for the tree to grow under them. And essentially, the tree will treat those like a hole. I'm very curious to see how these uh, age. I've seen some now that have been about five years. They're doing very, very well. And this particular site here near Lake Tahoe, the growth rates are very slow. And growth rates, of course, are something you really have to pay attention to uh, with these types of installations just so you can know how much room you might need to leave for your tree to grow. Here's some old pins from the Out and About Tree Resort in Southern Oregon. And these are problematic for the obvious reason that the cable is now enveloped and nobody can really inspect it. So if that cable was de deteriorating or it's been enveloped by the tree, nobody's going to know. In this case, the cable holds up a fairly large bridge and there's something needs to be done here. Now you can see that the tree is aggressively growing around the pin. And I think when I took this picture that had been in the tree for about six or eight years. Here's a great example of a suspended treehouse. This is my friend Tom. This company is called Free Spirit Spheres. He's on Vancouver Island in Canada. And this is an amazing treehouse suspended by a single cable that's attached to two trees. So there's a suspension cable and then in the middle of that, the, the suspension cable for the treehouse. These are gorgeous and quite remarkable. Check them out. Type of thing you see when you get out there and do this more and more. This is years ago. This guy was an architect, built this for his kids and his family, he was desperate not to hurt the tree. So this was the method he came up with, figuring that drilling holes or nailing into the tree would be a problem. He attached the tree house like this. Well, I, you can all uh, guess that there were quite a few problems beginning to occur here. Um, but this is the type of, of knowledge that we bring to the table that's really important. So what do they want from us? So these are some questions uh, that I've come across over time, the time I've been doing this. Here's one, should I install in trees on this property? Or is there something about the forest ecosystem that dictates a pole or a ground mounted course? Well, those are really good questions. It's very possible to build these courses using poles, even in a forest with little or with minimal impact. 
What about the design? Is this viable option for a tree? The guy said to me, I'm not an arborist, but I've seen many platform designs that are claimed to be low impact that have killed the tree or in the process of killing the tree. Like these are, we've seen them a lot of them, they're squeezed onto the tree. This does not work. So they, they want our knowledge. So they also really want to use trees. They want this participant experience that they're looking at so that people will come and use their course and they want uh, help from us in, uh, in helping them cheat, you know, show their clients why the trees are fun and why it's a good idea to use them. And then uh, to show the clients something about trees. Great opportunity for education. Here's another question. Are the trees that I'm planning on using going to be able to survive over time after I add the type of course or structure that I plan on building? Well, th those are the type of really thorny questions that a consulting arborist or a knowledgeable arborist can uh, help answer. And then I want to have a plan in place for a backup tree or trees in case the unforeseen happens. How can you help me with that? Well, I can help a little bit, but um, you know, really, you, you must be careful because it's not always possible to reconfigure these courses uh, easily. What about permitting? You know, is the county or the state going to let me do this without a consulting arborist signing off? Who else might sign off? Engineer, planner, county building official? There's a lot of things to, you know, come up with these and good consultants know how to get these questions in. So consultation on the installation, how to do it. You know, how can you do this in a way that's minimally invasive as possible? Well, an understanding of tree anatomy and the species they're working uh, with, we can do that. How does the forest particular ecosystem dictate the installation approach? Well, that's a really good one. There are forests out there that are really fun to put these courses in that don't have any large trees or that may have trees that are growing at a really rapid rate, which can be a big problem. So they want these answers and we can find them for them. Is your builder up to par? Now that's a tricky one. I see these courses built by, you know, just about anyone. But more and more these days, if it's a uh, on the up and up op, you know, operation, they're going to have a professional builder in there. And you're going to want to know uh, uh, something about that builder. What is their experience? Have they built in these kinds of trees? It's so during operation of the courses, now they're out there running the thing. They really need to plan ahead to have uh, money and time to manage their trees and their ecosystem. And I really believe that's the real key here is ecosystem management. How do you manage them to ensure long-term viability? Sometimes with the amount of uh, disruption that these courses cause, you have to treat a forest ecosystem more like a yard or a park. You may need to add water. You may need to take other management uh, tactics, use other management tactics to get that, make sure that the trees are going to be uh, strong, viable, and vigorous. Again, how does that forest ecosystem influence the, the management you're thinking about? So you need to know where are you and what kind of forest is this and what kind of changes might the construction of the course have brought. Then, and this is a very important, what and where are the hazards in the forest to look out for? And widow makers, unstable or dead trees, anything that's in the vicinity of where people are going to gather or that could fall on the course is very important to note and to consider making snags out of those trees. We've seen uh, trees tied back so that if they do fail, they don't fall into the zip line. Um, and we arborists can use our risk assessment skills to find these trees and point them out. Staff training. We arborists should be helping train the staff because it's not realistic for them to bring, you know, someone like me to their course every year, especially if I'm flying in from out of state. So they need the people that are on the ground every day to be able to identify tree problems so that they can be addressed quickly, so they can call a local arborist that's helping them, or if necessary, communicate with the consultant and say, hey, we've got a problem here, we need it. Here's a sad story. This guy told me he had this great tree. He had some dieback in it one year. They called a the forester out. We want to develop a plan to save the tree. Well, the forester did his or her best, but he was a forester, not an arborist. So some good information there, but his basic prognosis was the tree would most likely bounce back. Well, you know, the tree did not bounce back. And so these guys are out of pocket 
somewhere about 30K, and then lost revenue for the time that the course is down while they're reconfiguring. I've had uh, several courses where we've created uh, turn trees into poles uh, and so that we could use them for a couple more years uh, because they're, you know, there's, there's a lot of money being lost and they don't want to spend money if they don't have to. So if you're doing this kind of work, there's a lot of data that you would try to collect and it really depends on the budget and what's going on here. But the list I put up here is basically uh, most of it and it's a lot of data. So developing as-built drawings and then collecting tree-specific data for every pin or attachment in the course, that's the kind of things that we do. It's complicated and it's very, very interesting to figure out ways to do this that uh, give you a data set that you can actually use to do something or to plan ahead. So some more examples here. In this case, the builder, his idea was that you could put that compression washer and that you can see in the lower bolt there. And when those got squished, he would know the tree was pushing on the fitting and they were just gonna back the bolts out of the tree a little bit to allow for growth. Well, my opinion was that no engineer would okay that. And as we arborists know, every time they back that bolt out, they're probably breaking the cambium again and basically wounding the tree uh, yet again. And so there could be some long-term problems with that for sure. There's another uh, place in the course, very high up 10,000 feet in the San Bernardino Mountains. Here is the cable wrapping style. The blocks are meant to spread the load, but because the cable can't slip, there they go, drilling in bolts through some of the blocks. So they basically, have, you know, they've, they've put a pin in the tree. And my point would be for many of these, it might be wiser to put hardware in the tree uh, and to hold the cable, avoid the wrapping because they're poking holes in the tree at any rate. So places in the tree that get abraded or worn, also a problem. Here's another example of a tree loaded up with gear. There's a bridge cable up above there and you can see the bolts have been uh, put through the blocks to keep it from slipping. And then you can see that uh, style of installation that this guy came up with uh, to try to protect the tree, which I don't think was really working very well. Although in this particular site, the uh, growth rates are very slow. Here's the same site in uh, the San Bernardino Mountains. They were very proud of this tree. I was very, uh, uh, concerned. They had picked the oldest, grandest tree the, on the site. They didn't really understand the significance of the dead tops. Um, in old, old, old growth trees, this could be a six to eight hundred year old tree. Uh, cutting a few branches off can have a huge impact on the tree. And trees like this, uh, it's, you know, that one branch could be a couple or five percent of the tree's entire foliar uh, area. Things like this, like I said, they're going to want to cut that off pretty quick because of the client flow and potential uh, concerns by the guides. But I sure didn't want them to cut that branch off. That uh, actually was a huge part of the canopy of this very, very old tree. So when you see stuff like this, really hard to get your head around, you're going to be scratching your heads. But this is a you know very heavy 2,000 foot long uh, zip line cable that uses double cable. That's one style that you see out there where you're actually clipped into two cables as you zip across. But what do you what do you do about this? Look at the size of these trees. That's a uh, that cable there is anchoring. Uh, it's a backup anchor for the zip line at the base that wrapped around it. Putting all kinds of loads on these trees. Here's a 38 meter long bridge. Very very heavy and doing all kinds of things uh, biomechanically uh, to the trees that it's attached to. Uh, much better to use a elliptical shaped washer. They didn't understand why. This has to do with tree physiology and anatomy. And uh, it's, a, it's a no brainer to have washers made that are this shape. Again, very complicated loads here being added to trees. And so our job is to try to think about what the effect will be biomechanically on the trees that have these cables attached. And there's a bunch of loads uh, uh, in this tree here, set of trees. Here's another one in Alaska. 
That's 125 foot tall white spruce, <clears throat> about 24 inches diameter. That's a huge tree for this forest. And boy, a lot of load on it. Here's another one with two platforms, a zip line uh, coming and going from this tree and the spiral staircase. There's a lot going on there. It's a site up in Alaska, again, in a boreal forest and an example of how easily they can trash the forest floor, which in this case is very fragile. Here's a tree being tested that, you know, Ken and I suspected it would be hollow. We could see the conks all over the tree. We explored the forest and knew that those conks meant the tree was hollow. But here using a tomograph to confirm that indeed they had attached those zip line cables and bridge cables to a very hollow tree. So you get involved with uh, people from the city and county. Uh, this is in a city park in, uh, in Washington, the city engineer and the parks manager, and then the builder in the black cap on the left. A tree with a lightning scar. Uh, these are the type of trees that need level three uh, assessment to determine can you use it. In this case, no problem. Another really bold installation in California using the compression rings. This holds up a huge spiral staircase. There's a 600 foot zip line coming into the tree and a very heavy bridge off the other end. That's, that's the, uh, the tree uh, seen from the zip line cable. That compression washer idea, you can see it's not working uh, as evidenced by the crack in the board. People getting extremely bold with these kind of things beyond what you'd ever believe. Uh, the one here, uh, another example of, of pinning to the tree, uh, or excuse me, perching on the tree. But these things are getting really, really, uh, uh, you know, compl complicated and complex. And you can see they love the heavy timbers, and you can imagine the kind of loads that this is going to add to this group of Douglas firs on Orcas Island, Washington. This is in Pennsylvania. Uh, looking at trees there, the tree with the blue tape in the background there is a Noliria dendron tulipifer. The tree in the foreground is an eastern hemlock. It was basically being killed by the woolly adelgid, and these zip line designers didn't really get that, so we had to switch from one species to the other and doing tomography on the trees to be sure that they're using solid trees. I'm going to finish up real quick. I'm a little over time. Uh, here's a tree house in a camp in Washington State. Uh, when I first saw it, 12 maximum, I came down and said, how about four? And this tree needs help. We got the tree going by managing the soils, then did a thorough analysis of the tree, determined that with the help of some of my crazy tree house builders, they could rebuild this tree house money and uh, did that. But the tree, a very, very old big leaf maple with lots of decay in it. You can see my hoary hoary in the limb at the top of the ladder there. Uh, base the tree about six feet diameter, completely hollow. This picture here is actually a virtual representation of the replacement tree house that, uh, that was built. So that is not real. And that's the kind of skills that some of the tree house people have. Uh, it's fascinating. I think these, uh, these uh, techniques can be used in tree management for other things. And here we are testing. Sometimes we test and we drill with a micro drill right where the pin will go in, just to the depth of the pin, just to be sure no surprises lie in weight. Here's another very sophisticated modern treehouse attachment setup. You can see uh, very, very clever uh, to get the loads handled. And particularly in this tree, we had to be very careful about how we were loading things up. There's the finished treehouse. Quite remarkable. Everybody was very happy. Here's the last thing I'm going to show you. This is a canopy walkway in the Redwoods near Eureka, California. It's ADA accessible. It's going to be as much as 90 feet up as you work your way out from this initial part of the course. The terrain falls away. It's all built in post redwood. <clears throat> phenomenal, phenomenal things are being built in trees. I hope we get to see each other in person before too long. I hope you enjoyed this. I really tried to sort of get your juices going about tree supported structures. And uh, uh, I hope you get to check some out. Hello, the Indiana. 2021 virtual conference. This is Scott Baker coming to you.